Would you look with us this evening to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're going to start reading in verse number 9. Joy to have you in our services. Thank you for your time in prayer and worship. Thank you for the offering. The Lord is so tender to help us. Love on us, man. In the joy of working together, uh, I got to go see the boy that they was telling about that was so desperate uh, yesterday evening, and and to know that y'all had done talked to him and prayed over him, it gave me a a good shot at him and. The Lord makes a difference. <clears throat> and Chelsea, isn't it neat? Two years later, two years in a few months, in the, in the church they come. <laughs> oh, it's four years. Did you say 19? 18. Oh, 18. Wow. Woo! Faith. Just love Jesus. That's what faith is all about. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Wow. And to, to see that happen is... Faith has took its course in that life. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 9, Rejoice, O young man, in, the, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou, that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number one and two. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy old age the what he says? No. He says, and remember your creator when? In the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I heard what somebody said. It hurts. I can't do that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> remember when you're kicking up your heels, jumping over the fence and all that stuff, and now you barely can get out of the bed? He <laughs> said, what happened? <laughs> and so here is your wonderful opportunity to really look what God speaks into our lives from young on up to our age. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rains. And so he's just given us a good shot here to look at. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, you don't miss nothing, young or old, rich or poor, free or bond. You see every one of us right where we're at. Lord, you're always coaching us and encouraging us to stay on the right side of the road. Lord, I just pray, give guidance to each one of us, our youth on up, Lord, that wherever we are, we're younger than somebody somehow, even younger than maybe than Moses, at least when he died. Please give us guidance today. And we thank you for your word in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, man. I was talking to the men today and I could tell I I hit a little bit of lull just a bit. And I said, you know what? Do any of you guys, there's like 11 of them there that I was talking to in that first bunch. I said, if you're running 75, which side of the road? You got a two lane highway. Which side of the road do you want to be on? I'm like Ben, I want to be on the right side. Now, if you pull over in the left lane, do you know better? Yeah. If you don't turn your license in, I don't want you driving home. I'll I'll take care of you. You don't need no license. (laughs) Not till you get this fixed. Yeah, just the common sense factor is stay, stay in your lane. Yeah, don't cross over. And all, all kinds of little old gadgets have been fixed to trying to help us stay on the road right. I mean, they got, they got a white lines on some roads. They got intermediate white and yellow. They got little yellow flickers that's glued down right in the center of the road. And all of that stuff is saying something to us. It said, this from here over is your side and from there over is their side. And if you cross over, you're in the danger zone. And that, that's why they have don't pass here because you can't tell who's coming. And okay, you got 
you can pass, but be careful, there's a curve just ahead. All, all that stuff is out there for a reason. And so I asked them, I said, which side of the road are you going to be on if you're running 75 and it's a two-lane street highway? They said, oh, we want to stay on the right side. I said, well, what are you doing in jail then? <laughs> I said, don't you know you pulled over into the own common traffic. But thank God you're not dead. You're just in jail. And the Lord slowed you down long enough to get you over back on the right side of the road. You don't know how to drive good spiritually. And so we've got to have somebody to help us. His name is Jesus. Whoa. And so whether you're just a young believer or you're young in body, wherever you are, we need to hear the voice of the Lord talking to us and, you know, what's dealt with in the youthful mind, and I wish all of our young people were here, but the Lord knew who would be here, and I guess these, uh, these, these, these young ones, is there, we got about four that's real young. Let's see. One. That's not you. Or, no, that's, <laughs> I see Mama now. I see Abby and Sonny and Jake boy. I don't know where's the man right there. Savannah, there's that baby right there. Yeah, and these little ones. Yep. Anyway, hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> here you know somewhere we gotta. You would think, well, get over on the right side and stay there. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit from the thought this this evening. Tempered with the knowledge of judgment that we would temper our walk with Christ with the knowledge of judgment you know why the guys in the jail said I'm going to stay on the right side of the road you know why they don't want to get run over neither do I I think that's a smart that's a smart way and friends the same thing is spiritually so completely equal and pure if you stay on the on the right side you've got a good chance of making it and if you cross over you're instantly in the danger zone. I love what's said here because this is uncommon, but it starts out with have a good time, enjoy your life, but temper it with knowing you're gonna face the judgment. Now, if you get out on the road and you, you disregard everything out there and you drive on the left side of the road and you run 100 miles an hour and all that, if, if you survive long enough for the policeman to stop you, the tickets after a while will get big enough, you won't have no license. They say three strikes and you're down. You get three moving violations in a row. Now that's the way it was whenever I was driving. It may be, I don't know how it is now, but three, three moving violations in a row, with like in a month or something, you don't have no driver's license. Yeah, that affects you. <laughs> and so our walk with Christ, he, he don't mind you enjoy driving. Yeah. And the same thing spiritually. He wants you to enjoy your walk with Christ. Stay on the right side, enjoy Jesus, but don't let the devil coach you over into something that's spiritually illegal. So the, the first thought I get out of this comes from this verse, verse number nine of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart. Enjoy it. Have a great time. And I believe that from the, from the cradle to the grave, you can live for Jesus and you can enjoy living for Jesus. I got to say when I was 19, and it's better than any dance I've ever been to. It's better than any drunk a million times over. And all the other things that comes, all of it, ever, ever, what I found in Christ in one moment was better than all the life I had lived before. And if you find the Jesus, that Jesus, and not just religion, you're not going to feel like, oh no, I missed something. Friends, let me tell you, if you live for God, the only thing you missed is going to hell. Hang in there, stay true to God, stay on the right side of the road, and he's, it's going to be all right. You'll see. Woo! Glory. You're going to see. If you go the other way, the cost is way more than you're going to want to pay. So enjoy living. Would you say it with me? Enjoy 
living, but temper it with the thought that I know judgment is coming, so because of that, I'm going to enjoy what I can do, not what I can't do. And the devil, he brings up every thought of what you're not supposed to be doing and says, well, na 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 you Christian, you can't do it. That lying sucker knows that that sin leads you to spiritual death. That's why the Lord said, enjoy the things of God and don't look back at the filth that's being thrown out in front of you. Hang on to the Lord. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth and let thine heart cheer thee. In Genesis chapter 37, verse number 28, a really wild thing happened to a 17-year-old boy. Who's within three or four years of 17? Hey, there's one there, there's one there, there's one right there. Are you within three or four years of 17? Of course. There's one, yeah, within three or four years of 17. Here's a, here's a young man within, with, uh, this man is 17 here according to Scripture. Look at him, here, here we are in Genesis chapter 37, verse number 28. <clears throat> then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Now, a real slave was worth 30 pieces. That was the normal price. 30 pieces of silver, that's what they get for Jesus. But this boy, they discounted him. He said, rather than dying, we'll take a cheaper wage. And friends, I want to tell you, the devil will buy you for a song if you let him. He's a cheap shot. And he's so destructive in what he does. They drew him, lifted him up. Joseph fell out of the pit, sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. That was a bad day for Joseph. The, can you imagine the thoughts at that young age that swirled through his mind that daddy, daddy's not going to know. Not only have I been sold, but I have been taken out of the land of Canaan into a foreign country. That would be like the drug cartel hauling you down to Mexico and selling you to, for whatever. That, 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 that would be the kind of fear or somebody getting you and shipping you off to China or uh, Russia or whatever. That, that is happening, friends. That, there's all kinds of stuff like that that happens in our world even today. But here this young man is, is run off, carried off, sold away. But I want you to notice in Genesis 39, we're going to start reading verse number one. Though he has been abducted, thrown in a hole, drug out, sold as a slave, a cheap one. When he gets down there, Potiphar buys him and something happens. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, probably for 30 pieces of silver because they, they wanted the full price. Bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he's been sold twice now. Doesn't that make you feel good? He was a prosperous man. Wow. Friends, I think this this, we need to take note of this guy. Because look, here he is a young, he's 17, and look, look at him. He's a pro. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was what? A prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but prosper seems like he's making a hand, and they're liking him. He is doing Good. What side of the road is he on? He's on the right side. And guess who's on the right side with him? God, Jehovah, Jesus. Yes. Look at, look at the third verse. And his master saw that the mm was with him. Did you know that they can tell who's with you, Savannah? <laughs> yeah. Woo. His master saw that the uh, was with him and that the mm made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Don't you love those two names? Lord, Lord. The, he could tell the Lord was with him and he could tell that the Lord made everything he did prosper in his hand. Is he having a bad day now? I, I'm not seeing that here. He's just 17, but look what God is doing with this young man. You know why? Because he set his eyes to fulfill what is spoken here in Ecclesiastes. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth and walk 
in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. He's getting her done. He's walking it out. And look here, look here in, the, in verse number, uh, what was it? Verse number four, back in, th thank you so much, Sister Leatherwood. And the Bible says, at 17, Joseph found grace in, in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house. Now, everybody else at this point, I mean, for a young lad like this, for everybody to be under him, that's an incredible statement. But what? look how his dad treated him. His dad looked at him and said, you know what? Your brothers are wild and they're wicked. Would, would you go see where my flocks are? Because I don't know if they're selling them or what's going on, but I need, to, I need somebody that I can trust to oversee. And guess what? They, they throwed him in the hole and sold him for, for that. But look, look at here. Here the Lord sets him up again. He's set up over the whole house, made him overseer over his house and all that he had, he put into his hands. Now that's trustworthy. He could trust him. Verse number five. It came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. How many things that Egyptian's looking around and saying, buddy, I have got me a, a jewel. I've got me a good hand. And men and ladies, I beg you, wherever you work, let, let the people that you're under see that what you're doing, you're gonna do the best job that you can do while you're there. Nobody's perfect. Everybody makes some mistakes, but there's a difference between a mistake and just in a lazy, I don't care. And that's seen real quick by the per person you're working for. I know Sister Messick can never see that, but Sister Messick is a good hand, real important. Oh man, when you're running a business, it's, I mean, you're dealing with the public. Wow. So here, this young man, 17 years old, He's fulfilling what we, we looked at there. L look down here, it says, for Joseph's sake and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So guess what? His burrows are doing good. And his camels have shed that old long hair off. And they're saying, oh, man. And, and the sheep are coming in and they don't just have one lamb, they've got two with them. That's, you ever read the, the Song of Solomon? He said, all my ewes bring, bring, come in with two, two little lambs on them. That's the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich. And man, that year they shared and the wool was like, this is the best wool. This is the cleanest wool. We're making more money than the cows are, but we gotta have cows anyway. We like to eat beef. But anyway, these, these sheep are doing good. The goats there in that uh, pasture rotation. And look at them goats. Woo, you ever seen the amount of hair? Who's ever seen a hair goat? Not very many. Well, I, I ran a range that had 980 mohair goats on it. They were all stags, which means they were, they were little mutton goats. They were hymns and not shims. But they, they was young, just uh, yearlings, uh, yearlings and a half maybe, and uh, Man, when we, we shared them twice a year, you couldn't believe the amount of hair a goat can carry. They, 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 they would get slow, you could rope them a foot. They had so much hair on them, they couldn't get away from you. But mister, you share that hair off of them, it'd take you a racehorse run one of them down. <laughs> it was these 980 goats, well, we'd, we'd bring them in, them shears would go to cut, and you never seen so much mohair. Have you ever had a mohair garment? There, okay, there's a few of them. I don't guess I've ever, mom, you ever had one? Me neither. We're poor people. We just use cotton. But man, they, they bought and sold that mohair down there around San Angelo and wool was high and had, it, was, it, was a, it was a big deal. And here's Joseph, all that, look what it says. Everything that was in the house was doing good and everything in the field was doing good. I never forget, I had, I'd never been around, I hadn't been around sheep. I've been around animals all my life, but never around sheep. And so, my boss, you know, I could, you know, he was telling me about the sheep and I'm, I'm looking a little bit puzzled because between the, I, I come out of a feedlot, there was nothing there but cattle. And we raised, we raised some cattle there when I was home and man, all, all my business was around cows and to have them, we had 3,500 ewes and about 40 lambs, I mean 40 rounds with an R. <clears throat> anyway, 
Man, the, he said, I said, what about these sheep? He said, when the cows don't make it, these sheep pay them out. <laughs> I said, wow, that's incredible. You know what he said? A lot of, a lot of his ewes, if, if his ewe just had one lamb two years in a row, he shipped them. Because all of them that had two lambs, them's the ones he killed. <laughs> Yeah, well, two's better than one anytime, isn't it? Yeah, and he said, plus we get to tag them the, on the sheep. You know, we tag them one time and then we share them once. And so both of those, were the, you know, the wool from those uh, sharings paid, paid money. He said, when the cows don't make it, the, the sheep will pay them out. I thought, man, I never forgot that. That would sound like a good, like a good way. So enjoy living. This is what I'm talking to you about right now is enjoy living. And look at this man. Uh, it came to pass for the time that he had made him overseeing his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and blessed the Lord and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Look at verse number six. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he knew not all he had save the bread which he did eat and Joseph was a... Why didn't it say he was a sad person because his own brothers had got him and sold him for 20 pieces of silver. What, what's, wrong with this, what's wrong with this young guy that he could be happy in a foreign country sold by his own brethren? What's that about? Friends, that's what God is talking to us about. That we've been, we've, we've been kicked out of the world because we claim Christianity. I hope you're kicked out. Yeah. And, and our hope now is that, Lord, we're going to have a great time touching other people with this gospel. Nobody wants a gospel that all it is is. I don't know if that looks like you up to you, but I'm just saying, if you don't like it, they sure ain't going to like it. But if they can see that you love the Jesus that bought you with his blood. And that nothing can take away the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And friend, what we see in these six verses is not a little trod down 17 year old boy. But here is a young man that's making a hand and even his master's looking him over and saying, this guy enjoys living and he don't have marijuana. What he's got is Jesus. He don't have an outside woman. No, sir. He believes in celibacy. Wow. How many still out there? Even when, okay, enjoy living. Does that mean taking in Potiphar's wife? How come he wouldn't? Because he recognized that everything I've lived for is broken if I step over that line. And he tells that girl, said, I can't do it. And here's why. I, I can't sin against my God. Woo! Don't you love that? They throw him in the penal institution. But friends, I just want to tell you that he still kept his jaw and you follow that man's life. He is favored plumb down until he's second only to the Pharaoh in all the land of Egypt. You know why? He's having a good time. He's enjoying the Lord in his life. And I beg you young people and moms and dads and young believers, enjoy God. Because if you believe the lie that you're missing something that this world is offering, you will go back and you'll swap eternity with God for eternity with the devil. That's important to get that figured out as a young person. He said, as young people, don't, don't break out of this right here. In 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 2. This is kind of a hidden story in scripture. I talked about the man that she's working for. But I, I think this is so precious. I talked about Naaman just a little bit this morning, but look at this. The Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel. Look at this word, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And so this little girl is working for Naaman. She knows that she's been taken in a war and the rest of her life she'll be dedicated to Naaman's wife. And so she just throws the towel in and says, there ain't no God. And is, is, that, is that the way it goes down? She waited on Naaman's wife. Let's look at her in verse number three. And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, is that talking down or talking up? Boy, don't you love her spirit? She said, man, 
I know I'm a captive. I know, I know by war that I'm, I belong now because y'all took me in a war. But I just want to tell you, if my master Naaman knew the prophet that was in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Boy, what a wonderful testimony. From a, the girls hardly had any voice in the world, but this is in the Bible because she's having her a good time because she knows who God is in her life and she understands the power of the Lord even in those days in Israel. Look at the next verse. And one went in and told his Lord. So somebody goes and tells Naaman what this little girl from Israel is saying. Thus and thus said the who? Said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Now what if she had just swelled up and said, you know what? I don't care if the idiot dies. I hate being here. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can take life. And, and the choice that you make, friends, sets you up either to do good or to do bad. But because she chose to make it as good as she could and say, you know what? Can you imagine what Naaman done when he come home with his leprosy healed? There ain't no telling what that girl got the rest of her life. The Bible, the Bible don't tell, but anything she wanted, I'm sure. Said, hey, hey, baby. <laughs> yeah, you're like my daughter now or whatever. Yeah, you're at the top of the ladder. You told me how to get my problem fixed. And friends, if we'll, if we'll live the life and enjoy the gospel that we know and be proud, I know that everything about life is not, is not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. Yes, is. And so we take all of our imperfections and say, Lord, I'm laying these here down and I'm just living for you. You are my perfect savior. You're my perfect example. You're my perfect sacrifice. You're my perfect joy. You're my perfect peace. I'm not going to get down the mully grubs and go to whining, but I can't live like the devil and still go to heaven. I'm so proud that there's healing in the land of Israel. I'm just going to tell it until they tell Naaman. Woo! And the story leaked out into the ears of her master because she was enjoying living and living for God. In chapter 12 and verse 1. Of Ecclesiastes. Thank you Sister Leatherwood. Remember now. Thy creator when? In the days of thy youth. While you're young. Get a hold to God. And don't bow to nothing. Except the lordship of this Jesus Christ. When I see and hear and read about in the songs of the three Hebrew children, do you see those men as, as, oh no, it's so bad. No. I, I was talking to Brother Lacey McAdams, and he, his children are going to, going to school there in uh, close to Leveland. I think he's pastoring in Leveland now. Anyway, when, when his uh, dad started telling me about all the awards that uh, Lacey's children had won, and, and I, I mean, in, in, the, in their schooling and stuff, I, I was just, one of the, one of the deals, he, uh, that, one of Lacey's daughters got a $96,000 uh, scholarship to go to the to school at Abilene, and she got a $50,000 one at another place because she was the high point individual and all of her grades, I mean, it's still out there. No, $50,000 might not mean nothing to you, but that's a lot of money to me. And 96000 whoa, can you imagine how many good horses you could buy with that? <laughs> she said, no, no, not that way. Think, think of that. And here, this, this little girl, uh, 18 years old, 96000 one place, 50000 baby, you do your choosing. We want you to come and be with us. Wh where does that happen? That, that did not come from a life wrecked out with marijuana and drugs and in, uh, no sir. That come from a young lady that's lived for God since she was just a child. And she's enjoying her life and she's believing God. The Lord, wherever I go, let me. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, man. You remember the song? They wouldn't bend, they held on to the will of God, so we're told they wouldn't bow their knees to the idols made of gold, they wouldn't burn. 
they were protected by the fourth man in the fire. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. Can you imagine the joy when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and said, Didn't we throw three men bound into the fiery furnace? Yeah, oh Lord, three men. You know what he said? Lo, I see the fourth man and he looks like the son of God. Woo! Mister, the next words out of his mouth was this. Meshach! Shadrach and Abednego, come forth and come hither. Wow, there ain't no God that can deliver like this God has delivered. Wow. I mean, the next words out of that man's mouth, he said, every nation, did you know he ruled the entire world at that time? And three young people turned his dynasty because they enjoyed living for God. Don't let the devil beat you up, young person, for living for Jesus. Kick him off in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, you know what? I'm going to have a good time. And I'm going to have a good time living for Christ. Woo! Hallelujah. You know why? Because if you follow the prescription that's given here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 9, you're going to have something that helps you in your judgment. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. I was talking to the transit lady this evening, right after services. And she says, well, I just want to ask you something. I said, okay. So we would talk for quite a while. She said, is the old proverb, is that really right? And I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And she says, well, what about this? What goes around comes around. I said, well, baby, that is not a, pro a proverb. That's actually out of the Old Testament scriptures that whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. And so I said, that's why I'm talking to you about the Lord. Your life has been hard, but Jesus wants to save you. And she said, well, I don't know if I, I said, that don't matter if you believe in God or not. If you've not believed in God or not, I said, now you can. You can, you can turn that over to, to Christ, your life. Anyway, uh, that, that gives, us, it gives us hope to recognize it. I, I said, here's the reason I want to talk to you, because one of these days, your life is going to play out. I mean, she's already 76, and she's lived a hard life. And she's uh, walking on the road when I was going to uh, Rotan the other day and she was walking. I mean, yesterday, yesterday morning, she had walked out to the hill. You know, you know the hill where you turn like you're going down the road behind Highway 180 and, and you turn to go back across there to, uh, I think, Crossroad or something like that and, and on to uh, Rotan. She, she was already past that turn and, and walking. She was walking to Snyder. I saw her as I come by. I could tell she was a woman, but I, then I seen a car there broke down, and I thought, well, she must, her house must be right there close or something, you know, and I didn't want to scare her, so anyway, I was going the wrong direction. Anyway, I said, I saw you yesterday on the road, just out of Roby. And the way I knew it, she had on a pair of shorts that had Roby on them. And I thought, there ain't no Roby anywhere else in this country. She said, have you been to Roby? She said, well, I think that's a little town I passed through yesterday. She said, I bought a pair of these little, these little uh, Sports shorts, that's down to her knee. I mean, she, that's fine. But she said, I bought them for a dollar. It said, that's a lot. That's, they look nicer than what I was wearing. I said, well, they look like you got along pretty good with them, you know. Anyway, she said, she said how, you saw me? I said, oh, yeah. I, I said, uh, she said, why didn't you stop and pick me up? I said, well, I didn't figure you wanted to go to Rotan. She said, no, I didn't. I was going to Snyder. She said, well, right after that, a, a man and woman come by, picked me up and brought me to Snyder. I said, well, that's great. It's a good deal. So, the, the deal about living, however you live, is that one of these days, judgment is coming for all of us. And what goes around comes around is really 
whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. And if in your young life, you can really enjoy serving Jesus and live for him, guess what? As you go on through life, instead of having to live down the wild oats, you get to live up to the righteous acts of God in a joy. So temper, temper your knowledge, your life with the, the knowledge of the judgment of God. In verse number 10, he says, Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart. Don't be sorry that you're living for Jesus. Be proud. The devil is always trying to get a hold of you and say, look, look what you left behind. Well, friends, what I left behind is a hell hole. I am so thankful to be free. So remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Just shake that off and say, well, I don't know what's out there. Who does? Everybody's got to live somewhere. Just look around and look through the Bible and see who makes it the best. You know who makes it the best? The ones that stay on the right side of the road. Wow. When you just got a two-lane highway, know which side to get on. Get on the right side and stay over there. So remove sorrow. Put it away from you. <clears throat> The, the, we talked about enjoying living. The next thought I wanted to talk to you just a little bit is about this thought is that we must stand before the judge. That's going to happen. I had 17 moving violations at one time. I, I'm not proud of that. That was just ignorance. What I thought, though, I, I, I was working all the time, so I had money. And when I would get a ticket, I'd just go down there that night and pay for the ticket. And so Daddy didn't know that I was getting in trouble. So if Daddy didn't know it, God didn't care. That was my thinking. <laughs> It, isn't youth a little bit crazy sometimes? I know, Brandon, you, ne you never thought about that, did you? Does, does God know? Yeah. He knew, and Daddy found out. <laughs> I will never forget going to the judge. I guess it's my only time. Well, no, it was enough, one more time. <laughs> huh? <laughs> anyway, our judge at that time was Mr. Billingsley. Does anybody remember Mr. Billingsley? Mr. B okay, Mr. Billingsley, Mr. Billingsley stood about this tall. He was a midget. His body from right here up looked normal, but his legs barely come out to the end of the seat. And so I, I didn't say nothing, now let me tell you. But I, I, I went before Judge Billingsley and just in his office, he's just sitting there and here's daddy and me because I was summoned to get my license taken away because I had 17 moving violations. So daddy's with me and the judge is with me and I don't know, I don't think God was with me then. <laughs> <laughs> so whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. And so this little guy sitting there and his shoes are sticking right straight out, you know, and I'm looking at him and, I, and I'm trying to just look at his face because I know, whoa. So he went over this deal and looked at my record and uh, he said, there's no way I can leave you with your license. And I mean, he just, just looked at me right now, you know. And my dad said, he said, well, judge, this, this boy lives on a farm. And I need him to drive the grain trucks and to move the equipment around. And he, he needs his license real bad. And if, if, you, if you could see fit to leave him his license, I'll see fit that he never gets another ticket. I was just 17. And so the judge, he looked at my dad, and my, my dad was big, six foot two, and his hands was about twice as big as mine, and he looking at my daddy, and he looked at me, and he said, Braden? Oh, no, he didn't, he said, Danny. He said, he said Danny, he said, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, this is not going to work, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you have, keep your license. But you're going to have a two-year probation. 
two years. Now, when you're 17, two years probation seems like eternity. But he said, the first time you get a ticket, even if it's not your fault, if somebody else runs into you and you get the ticket, and it's one day before that probation is up, you're going to lose your license for two years. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, this is going to be just like, I will never forget this. He said, this is going to be just like an ax right over your head. And the first time you punch that foot feed down, because mine was for burnouts and racing, street racing. And he said, the first time you push the foot feed down and he smiled, he said, the ax is going to fall on you. <laughs> Unforgettable. I can still see his face right now. And I'm, I'm not near 17 now. Can you imagine going before God, friends, and knowing that because you walked away from him, that he can do nothing but ship you out to eternal damnation? The leeway is broken. If you don't live for God or I don't live for God, thank God he saved me at 19. I kept my license by the grace of God. I married. That's one thing that helped me. I didn't have to come back to town. <laughs> yeah. Woo! <laughs> Thank the Lord. For a good woman. <clears throat> so we must stand before the judge. That's going to happen. In verse number nine, it says, God will bring thee into judgment. That will happen for all of us. So acting innocent will not lighten the sentence. When dad come down there and picked me up, I was plowing. He come down there in the field and picked me up and he says, the judge is going to see you today over, he said, he thought all they, all they sent was three tickets. <laughs> and I'm going, oh no, when we get there and he tells him about these other ones. <laughs> oh no, man. <clears throat> So acting innocent will not lighten the sentence in eternity. So I beg you, we are all going to stand before God. And let me tell you, there's going to be some young people that's going to make it to heaven because they're, they're looking out and, and recognizing, you know what? There's a reason. There is a reason to live for God. And we're making our decision to follow on to know Christ. The writer says here in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 12, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, Doeth not that pondereth, doeth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? You think he doesn't know that you know? <laughs> it don't matter if you say you didn't know or I say I didn't know. Is that going to fix it? No. no, we know. And he that keepeth thy soul doth not he know it and shall not he render to every man. How? According to his works. There's no way we can squeeze by this just because we're young or old or whatever. Somewhere. We're going to meet the judge. And why not? Knowing that, my sermon this night is this, that we temper our life with the knowledge of judgment. That we know that's coming. So because of that, we're going to do it the right way. I love when you're shouting now. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to what? According to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. I've been, I've been reading this book and this phrase, and Connor may have to help me with it because it's, it's, it's evasive. The devil does not want you to learn truth. But in the writing, this man, this, this is the words, uh, I think his name is C. Hassel Bullock. He said, so critical is God's revelation through wisdom that the individual's posture toward her determines his destiny. So the way we act toward wisdom, toward what we know is right, the way we act, our posture toward that determines our destiny. At the time I was standing before the judge, my posture had not been very good. But I will tell you, that was the last ticket I had. <laughs> Woo! 
<laughs> you talk about restraint. Yeah, and I had a daddy too. He didn't beat me up or nothing. He just said, no more. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> you know why? Because I still wanted, I still wanted to be able to drive and I wanted to honor my dad and I didn't want the ax to drop on me. <laughs> yeah, judgment's coming, sure. So because of that, why not say, let me temper my life and recognize the Lord searches the heart. He tries the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. One of my best friends, 16 years old, I was telling Connie about him yesterday, how we, we were almost like, he was like a brother to me. His name was E.G. Hessler. He went to a ball game at, uh, down in the park, and one of the thugs picked him up that was about three or four years older than him. I can, I can name the guy right now. I know him. Big old thug. And he gave him some glue to sniff. And well, what? What difference does it make? It's not, it's not going to get you. And so he got so high on airplane glue. They poured it in a bag and then he held it up to his nose and sniffed it until he, he just went not unconscious, but just kind of crazy. And you know what he did at 16? How old are you, B? You're 15? Well, you got a year then. Oh, <laughs> longer, huh? Yes. At 16 years old, this young man, because he's so high on the fumes off this airplane glue, he starts eating the glue because he, he, had, he was past common sense. And Bridge, you, I know what you think. It's not going to be me. But friends, I'm going to tell you, you cannot fool with the devil without the devil taking you down. You, you play around with sin and sin's got one answer. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it's finished, what does it do? It brings forth death. It's not only physical death, but it's separation. It's the death of your walk with Christ. And that young man, whenever the, the thug recognized that, that it was eaten through him, that that glue was going in and eating through his throat and his, and, his, uh, and his esophagus. He runs him over there and dumps him out at the square. He didn't take him home, which wasn't about six or seven blocks to his house. So he walks about a half a block from the square down to the little light. I showed Connor kind of the light he died under yesterday. He walked down to that light pole and that's as far as E.G. Hessler ever got. He died right there, 16 years old. And I was a pallbearer at his funeral. And he died for nothing. You think the devil cares? You think 50 years later that the devil cares? And he's been in hell all, these, all this time. Raised in a Pentecostal church Saved, he had been filled with the Holy Ghost. He knew what it was to go to camp and he throwed it all away for airplane glue. I beg you, I beg you young people and young believers, hear what this book is saying to us today out of Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number nine. Enjoy living, but don't be stupid in the process. Don't throw away your walk with Christ for nothing because whatever it is, it's just pennies on an eternity that you could have that's worth all that this world could give you. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? What would E.G. Hessler right now after 50 years in hell, what would he give to be out today? And I told Connie, I said, you know what kills me is that he could have married and had children and I could, I could go see him and see his wife and see his children and see his grandchildren. But all of that was snuffed out because of the ignorance of sin. And I beg you, don't throw your life away. Hang on to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16 and 17, a young man is weeping his eyes out, but there is no place to repent. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel, you think the devil didn't buy him cheap? For one morsel of meat sold his birthright. 
For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was... If you think rejection from your peers is bad, can you imagine being rejected from God for all eternity? He was rejected from God, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. His repentance was never accepted because he sold his birthright and made mockery of it. And friends, you can just go so far and the Lord says, okay, if you want that way, it's yours. I, I told that boy yesterday, I said, God is not going to stop you from killing yourself. I know he didn't want to hear that. But I said, I want to tell you something. Judas, Judas was with Jesus for three and a half years. And he kissed him and walked away from him and went and hung himself. And, and Jesus did not stop him. And he's not going to stop you. If you want to be crazy... You can do it, but the cost is a way more than you're going to want to pay because we're not just talking about a little fun. We're talking about eternity. So I beg you as your pastor, don't throw your life away. Temper your walk in this life with the fact that I know the judge. I know the judge is, is watching me. And I know the ax is up there. If I punch the foot feet down on life and I go the wrong direction, guess what? The ax is going to drop. Yeah. I lost a brother when he was 23, had two beautiful baby boys and a beautiful wife, Dusty, just the, the younger boy, just under me, all over alcohol. 23 years young, he died within a quarter of a mile of my house in the ditch. No, it, it's not an easy thing, friends. I don't, I don't talk about it much because it breaks my heart. I went down there. I went with my dad and my brother to see him in the hospital whenever he's, he's done gone. My dad, he said, hey, I've been in the war. That boy's, he's dead. You talk about a knife piercing through your heart because I thought if you belonged to Bear Williams, nothing could bother you. You're going to live forever. But my dad couldn't even save him. He slipped out into eternity. Woo! Beyond anything that we could do. I beg you, don't throw your towel in. Hang on. Live for Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10. And I'm getting close to closing. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to have to appear there myself. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now judgment, I know you think that all judgment is bad. But that judge... Judge Billingsley done me a favor because he stopped me from being crazy behind the wheel. And he may, may have saved some other people's lives in the process. I know it saved mine and saved my license and a lot of other things about my life. And so the judge, if you do good, guess what? The judgment's going to be good. Yeah, whatever the Lord judged Joseph, what does he say? You hit the Ed Mac man. Woo! You play the whole course and man, you're going to the top of the ladder. He, he went to the top and stayed at the top because of the way he lived. So judgment comes both ways. You do good, good's going to come by you. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. You sow unto the Lord, you sow unto the Holy Ghost, you live for God. I'm going to promise you, friends, that by and by, you're going to look back and say, the best thing that ever happened to me was serving Jesus. Don't let the devil bring you to a standstill in your walk with Christ. Just walk on. Don't look back. Everything's going to be all right. He won't leave you in the dead of night. Woo! Yeah, hang in there. Why? Because it's going to be okay if you just stay with the Lord. Don't give it up. We're going to all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 17. We're coming to the altar. And if you call on the Father... Who, without respect of persons, judgeth according to, how does he judge us? According to every man's work. Past the time of your soul journeying here in fear. It's a respect that we look life over with and say, you know what? There's all kinds of stuff I can do, but there's a lot of stuff I ain't going to do because I love him too much to fail him now.
Would you come to the piano and stand together? I was talking to the men in the jail today out of Romans chapter 12, where he says to give your body as a sacrifice. And I said, that seems a little strange that God's asking us to sacrifice something. But I said, I would just like you to tell me what you have sacrificed by coming to jail. And they started, they started saying, well, I've sacrificed my freedom because they're locked up. I've sacrificed my automobile because I can't make my payment. The next one, I've sacrificed my house because somebody else had to take the payments over. Somebody, I've sacrificed being with my children. Another, I can't be with my wife. All of those sacrifices, and, and I said, and for what? In two words, for drugs and for alcohol. Are you willing to sacrifice your life for those things? Or to pull up with Paul and say, let my life and my body be a living sacrifice before the Lord. And what that means is I am going to tell the devil no. And I am going to tell Jesus yes. Whew, there is hope for us if we come to Christ and follow him. One of the boys told me that this three weeks ago was, I mean, plumb down on dope. That's trying to get him off of it. He just crumbled down. He looked at me today, squared the eyes, and he said, I will never go back. I have found, I have found what I need. His name is David. He said, I am going to live. I said, I am so proud of you. So I beg you this evening, look your life over and make your, make your calling and your election so sure that you don't go back. I want to give you an opportunity. If the devil's really been working on you and you say, Pastor, I know right now that I don't want to go back and miss my walk with Christ. And I'm believing God to let me be like Joseph and make good decisions. And then when I stand before the judge, he won't judge me for the bad things I did, but he'll judge me for the good. How many of our young people say, that's, I want to, I want to live right there. Here's some hands going up already. Anybody else? Here's another one right here. I see you right back there. God bless you. Anybody else? Pastor, I want to do good so when the judge comes and I meet him, I can say, I'm doing it God's way. Anybody else? Okay, Lord, we're praying right now that you would guide these young people and those maybe that's not young physically, but young in their walk with Christ. Lord, would you so place a special hunger in their heart to look their life over and make this decision that I don't want to be caught on the wrong side of the road. I want to live this life that I'm living for Jesus and bring honor to him in your precious name. Touch these souls today. Lord, let them live in the victory of your counsel. And for these things, we praise you. These altars open, would you come this evening and spend some time here with the Lord? Mm -hmm.